Hey everyone, uh, my name's Andy. I'm from Finding Value Finance. I'll be your host today. Uh, I've got John Palmy with us. Uh, I know some people on Twitter said, hey, you should go interview John. And I was like, well, yeah, let's do it. Uh, so I think John is similar to me. I know some people have made some comments uh, about the sectors that we like and stuff. So I kind of wanted to get him on the channel, get his opinions on some things. Uh, so thanks, John, for coming on. Really appreciate it. Happy to be here. So I'll start you off with, you know, tell me a little bit about your background uh, and your experience with uh, investing. So I don't want to be cliche, but uh, yeah, I was dabbling when I was a teenager. Um, this is back in the day before the internet. So you had to call in orders and commissions each way were about 30 bucks to buy or sell. Um, so I was doing that. Um, I was doing point and figure charting. Somebody gave me a book on point and figure charting that was written in the thirties. And the worst thing that could have happened, happened to me. I had an initial success. I was buying and selling put and call options. And so I had some initial success and I confused, uh, that particular time in the market or my luck, uh, with skill. And then subsequent to that, uh, basically lost most of my money, um, doing that. And so, uh, as I progressed through my, my life, I had an interest in investing, but, uh, my results were always kind of hit and miss because I didn't have a plan. I didn't have a, you know, I was jumping all over the place. Yes. I read a lot of books, you know, this, like I said, this is all pre-internet. So basically, you know, one day I went through my brokerage account. I I'm a big fan of Med Faber and, uh, he wrote some papers, white papers on some of these things. And it was like, you know, you should have an investment plan. You should write what you're trying to accomplish down and things like this. And so I went back and, you know, looked at my brokerage account and there was positions in there that were fossilized. I don't even remember the reason why I bought them and things like this. I said, this isn't going to work. And so on my professional career, you know, I don't, we don't reinvent the wheel. I'm in the energy business, electric generation, various types of uh, building and operating uh, various plants. And so we don't just go off and reinvent the wheel. We use what's already been successful in the last 150 years of power production. So I said, well, who are the world's best investors? Who are the most recognized successful investors? And so with the internet, obviously it was easy to get people's writings and things like this. And then I started noticing a pattern around a lot of the successful investors, which was uh, just kind of like summarize what Howard Marks kind of says about you kind of make your money when you buy whatever uh, asset you're buying. So uh, it became apparent to me that there are periods of overvaluation and undervaluation caused by all types of things, monetary policy, company specific, country specific. And so what I began doing was looking for situations where something was undervalued, unappreciated, um, blown up, blown out. And did it have a catalyst or did it have some kind of um, event or something that was happening specific to that uh, situation, which could cause a reevaluation by the market and for the market to market, market up? And obviously this attracted me to the resource sector because it's very cyclical. Uh, I became a, I went to a resource conference in Vancouver many years ago and met a guy, I think his name, I remember his name is Brian Dalton. He's the CEO of Altius Minerals. And I had a conversation with him. I'm sure he doesn't remember it, but the Altius method where you in the resource sector commit capital at cyclical bottoms and then harvest your returns at cyclical tops. I mean, it sounds easy and sounds intellectually, uh, well, what's so hard about that? Well, it's a lot harder than you start. Intellectually, it's easy, but then emotionally, we can get into that psychologically. That's where the stumbling blocks are. But anyways, um, I just kept then re writing things down, refining my process, um, started incorporating some other things. Um, I know we talked prior to this uh, before we started, but you know, um, incorporating various things that I thought would work, and then you know, basically when you know, writing down why I'm entering a position. I have a log. And I write it down, why am I entering this position? What's the reason why I think this is going to get revalued or move higher? And then I revisit that 
uh, periodically. And uh, if it's not coming to fruition or if something changes, then I sell because, you know, you look at people, listen, you don't have to be 100% right. You're not going to be 100% right on all of these investment decisions. As a matter of fact, you're probably not even going to be 50% right. But you don't have to be because um, like somebody like Stan Druckenmiller will say, you can be less than 50% correct. But as long as you uh, are buying value and letting it run, then it makes up for all of the the um, other bad decisions that you make and you're going to make bad decisions. And so getting past some of the biases and stumbling blocks about saying you were wrong and moving on. I um, mean, it's like the difference between good golfers and bad. If you make a bad putt on hole seven, you can't go to the tee on hole eight and, or uh, uh, on the eighth hole and be thinking about the previous putt. You have to worry about the drive you're getting ready to make on that hole. So, uh, I mean, these are all cliches and it seems easy, but like I said, I mean, I think temperament, challenging my own temperament, challenging my own biases, as Munger said, constantly fighting against my own biases and, and, and I certainly haven't got there yet, but that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, it took many years, many decades. And then I think another thing that was important was to, you know, I'm just going to be honest. I like to tell my story a little bit. I'm out there. Um, you know, I didn't grow up with a lot of money. And so I remember telling, I mean, I think I had a subscription to Forbes or Fortune, get the Fortune 500 every year. Even when I was like a teenager, I was like, I want to be on the front of this cover. And so, you know, that's motivating you to get rich quick. And so that's not a good thing to do because then you're chasing shiny objects. And then I realized, you know, when I, I, I tell people many times, even on my channel or discussing, you know, Sir John Templeton, you know, that's your big, biggest danger trying to get rich quick or not having proper expectations. I challenge people, go to the cov go to the first page of the any Berkshire annual report or to uh, Fairfax Capital, Prem Wetza in Canada. Look, they have the returns every year that they've averaged. So what's what Buffett is considered maybe arguably the best investor of all time. Well, he doesn't average 100 or 200 percent a year. You know, it's 18 and a half or 20 percent a year through all the ups and downs. And that's why that compounds over time. And that's where the real wealth is generated. So it took me a while to set proper expectations, understand compounding, um, so it, it was an evolution. So what, one of the things I try to do, yes, I have a newsletter and I try to, you know, point out things that people can take a look at that I think are undervalued or have a chance, you know, to appreciate. But I also try to fit in there as taking all that wisdom. I wish I would have known the things that I know now I'm 56. I wish I would have known them when I was 16 or 26. And so that's why I'm happy to do these, uh, any talk to anybody, because I think a lot of, there's a lot. I know my demographics is you can check them up on uh, YouTube. And I have a lot of young guys, mostly male, young. It's like, you know, understanding how valuable that time hat, that time component that you have. That, and you don't have to do it in one year or one quarter. You know, the worst thing that could have happened over the last several years because of the Federal Reserve and all the machinations of inserting themselves in the market is have things like these Bitcoin things happen, stuff like that. Yes, a lot of people made money, but it sets the wrong mentality. Well, I'm looking for the next thing that's going to go up a thousand percent. That's not normal, guys. That's, you know, that's a that's a speculative bubble. So that's kind of where I'm at. I was a little bit long winded there, but that's kind of the my introduction, I guess, a spiel. Well, John, you I, I know that you bought a lot of the bottom in commodities. I went back, I, I've looked at your videos, I've seen it. You, you've hit, you hit the oil and gas sector pretty good at the bottom, energy service, I saw you did that. You're in uranium, you're in all the right locations. Uh, in my opinion, it seems like. How, how are you finding these, you know, this value? What are you doing to find that value in the market? Uh, it, are you using technical analysis, fundamental analysis? Are you looking at companies that are just blowing out? Are you looking at like ratios? Like, what are you using to get your entry points? Because uh, I know you've bought the bottom in a lot of this stuff uh, and, and you're doing quite well because I've seen it. Well, let's mm -hmm. just talk about uranium and oil services for, for just a couple of examples. So uranium, you have to understand something. I've been talking about uranium since 2016. That's a long time. That's seven years ago. And um, it was obvious to me that when 
I mean, it's simplistic. The price of uranium is below the production cost for the marginal producer. You basically uh, are consuming, um, you, you have a uh, cannibalistic type situation. You know, people need to understand something about resource extraction, keyword extraction. So if you're in a resource extractive industry, you're pulling things out of the ground. If you're not replacing what you're pulling out of the ground, at some point, you're going to go out of business. And you're not going to replace things that you're pulling out of the ground if your costs are 25 or $30 a pound for uranium and you're only getting 11 or $12. You're just trying to keep the lights on and hope that things turn. And so what ends up happening is, is then you just have a uh, industry that goes into decline. Now, quite frankly, um, I was a little bit early, you know, get, get derailed by things like Fukushima and things like that. But I knew that that was temporary. When I saw, when I saw for example, Look, I'm in, I, I have the advantage because I'm in the energy business. You see the industry crash after something like that. Okay. You know, why would a country like Germany turn off its reactors? There was a different. So you see these things that are happening politically that aren't really based on logic. And it, I even knew the Japanese would eventually. I, you can, I've talked about this many times. I knew the Japanese. They have no choice. I lived in Japan for three years. There are no natural resources, zero in Japan, except for the brain power of the Japanese people. And so they import, you don't, if you want to have the society, you have to have so many terawatts a year. If you're not going to get them from your nuclear plants, then you're going to get them from imported LNG, coal, what have you. Uh, because I lived in Japan and it's not going to be uh, powered by renewables. So just not possible. So um, knowing these certainties, uh, you know, but that doesn't, the, the argument would be then, well, you know, you're sitting here telling me you were in uranium from 2016. Well, what about the opportunity cost? Well, I know from previous things that I've done that if I'm certain in my conviction, in my analysis, I knew it was just a matter of time. So I kept buying and buying. I mean, I remember when there was only two or three people on the internet talking about uranium. John Quakes, myself, and Trader Ferg. That's it. you know. And now everybody's talking about uranium. Well, that's when we were buying. I remember being on a call like this with Trader Ferg and we were buying Paladin at five cents a share, eight cents a share, something like that, lamenting that should we buy more. Um, so then it's just a matter of sitting there. And like I said, I wrote it down. Nothing had changed in my analysis. I knew that nuclear uh, was going to have a renaissance. I knew that it was going to come back. You could see it happening in not necessarily the developed world, but in the developing world. And I knew I had a thesis around, well, energy security is going to trump everything. And so what are you seeing? Uh, okay, well, you know, um, they just turned on plant Vodal in South Carolina or Georgia, and uh, it's $30 billion and took 10 years and Westinghouse went out of business. But you can build the same type of reactors in China in three years for $4 billion. And that's what they're doing. So um, that's where the, you know, I think the vindication comes. And then I, then I know that in these cyclical industries, when they do turn, they go like they are now where, where, you know, this is when you get paid off. So that opportunity cost goes away. Again, set your expectations. If we get some of the stocks I have in my portfolio in the newsletter, they're up six or 700%. Well, was that worth sitting there for six years? And, in, 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 you know, well, you could make the case that if you average the return out, then we're probably beating Berkshire. So that's what you have to do. And then, you know, uh, but what you see is I think a lot of folks don't do that kind of work. Uh, it's, it wasn't fun to sit there with nothing happening because, you know, people want action. They want something to happen. And the market doesn't care what you want. It's going to do what it does. And so um, anyway, that's like on uranium. You know, I'll be honest, you know, I got short circuited on offshore oil the first time. It was coming back before COVID. It was slowly utilization rates are coming. Then we had COVID and everything shut down. And we had another downturn that kind of wiped out the rest of the marginal producers. So, um, you know, I was talking about, I remember making a video where I said, well, it's Ensco at the time, but now it's Valeris. If I had a billion dollar, $1.5 billion, I would have bought the company. Well, that was just before it, uh, the crash uh, because of COVID. And nobody, you know, the recovery got short circuited. So, you don't get it right all the time, but I think, you know, it was inevitable because, you know, you've had an underinvestment like an offshore for a decade. Why? Because shale, all the 
money and all the activity and all the interest was in shale because it was a short cycle type situation. And who's going to, you know, no one's going to walk into the boardroom at Shell or these other places when shale was keeping prices down and we're going back and forth with the Saudis and these, you know, $50 a barrel and all this stuff and say, well, I want to, I want $5 billion for an FID for this 10 year project. You would get laughed out of the room, but now it, things have changed, you know? So uh, we're in a situation where um, shale seems to be peaking in the U S that was the primary driver of new supply. And uh, you know, everybody knows it that's in the oil industry. And so now you're seeing FIDs come back. Uh, you see offshore Guyana, you see, Namibia, you see all these places, the North Sea now is going to be coming back and you don't have enough equipment. And so it's just another supply demand situation. And now you, you, you reap the benefits. I'm, 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 I'm telling these stories as quick as I can, because there's more involved, but you, I think you get the point. Uh, that's kind of, you know, uh, just using two examples. I mean, I can give one more. I mean, the country of Cyprus, I think it was 2011. Okay. They had that bail, bank bail in. And the Cyprus stock exchange crashed 95%, 95%. But there were companies on the exchange that had most of their sales and earnings not in Cyprus, and they also went down. And so you weed through the, you separate the wheat from the chaff and you find things that are down just in sympathy because Cyprus sucks and sell everything, but you realize the country's not going to dry up and blow away. At some point, time heals things and things recover. So there was chances are like Logitech get a 400% gain in a year and a half. You know, there's, there's always these type of opportunities, but the average person, it takes a little bit of grit and you got to do work. You can't just rely on somebody, nobody on the internet told, you know, uh, on a YouTube video, you had to get in there and dig through it and say, okay, well, I'm buying at the bottom. Everybody hates this. I'm the, I'm one of the few people out here doing this and, you know, but I, I think it, the, you're not gonna you're not going to be successful as an individual retail investor messing around with Apple and all these. You have no advantage there. You have to go into the small fishing holes where nobody's at. I hate to use these kind of like cliches and stuff or these metaphors, or but this is that's it's reality. You got to go where nobody else is, and and they can't play. Institutions really can't play in uranium right now or offshore. They're too small. Yeah, I'm trying to sum it up. I think I understand your approach because your approach is basically this very similar to mine. Um, you identify where the value is in the market, maybe off based off of underinvestment or something that occurs, the cyclical underinvestment that we're seeing in commodities here. The the thing that I think a lot of people get wrong, and I want your opinion on this, is I think that people think, even if you're a good investor, that we are timing these things, these investments with the degree of accuracy of months. Uh, but in reality, what I do and probably what you do, I'm guessing is we're buying for years at a bottom kind of basing pattern, so to speak. And then when it comes out of that pattern, that's when you reap the rewards of that, of that waiting there. And that quote opportunity cost that people talk about, oh, you were in it for three years. I'm like, yeah, but you're not gonna get a thousand, 2000% return if you're not in it at the low. So talk about the, the the time frames that you use, the strategies that you deploy and the and the time frames that you're using, because I think a lot of people get their time frames not correct. You have to have the correct time frame to get these types of returns uh, and these bottoms that you're that you're doing. No, you've said it exactly. And I think what you're gonna find if you're gonna <laughs> if you're gonna speculate or invest like this is you're always gonna you're always gonna underestimate how long these things take every single time. And you're just going to be like, man, how long is this going to take? What's going on here? And you're going to be constantly challenged. And that's why you really have to do a lot of work and, and, and build your conviction because you are going to have to sit there. Those are my time frames, three to five years, three to five years. What are you talking about? Well, I'm trying to turn a dollar into 10, not 10 into 11. If I'm, if I was running a portfolio for a major company and I have quarterly re reports to an investment board, of course, I'm going to run the portfolio differently. My time frames are different. But me as a retail investor trying to build wealth over a, a lifetime, especially for younger guys that can take more risk, I mean, that's that's perfectly appropriate. You only, do, do the math, uh, Andy. I mean, that's what these guys don't, a lot of guys don't do. You only need a couple of those in a whole lifetime and you're set for life. Okay. It's not like you have to make a career out of this thing. So 
Um, if you go into one of these situations and you have the conviction, then you should go in big. You know, you don't put all your net worth into uranium junior mining stocks. That's not responsible. But you could have bought Cameco. Cameco's up three and a half times since it's low. Okay. I mean, that's where the institutions are going to go. Um, you can, you know, do things like that. Uh, if you want to lower your risk the whole way up or while you were sitting there, you could have, you know, had your position on, you could have sold call, call options against to generate. There's all kinds of little things you can do while you're waiting. So, um, yeah, you're talking about three to five years sometimes. And, uh, and, I, and, and you just need to prepare yourself mentally and psychologically for the fact that and emotionally, um, that you're, it's going to take longer than you, than you probably think. Well, here's, here's another thing. As you go and you wait for this to develop, um, you take a position based off the valuation gap in the market. Then I think the investor, and I do this myself, we look at what could potentially come five, 10 years from now. That is why we're in it. We're not buying it for today's market condition. We're buying it because of the squeeze that could potentially occur uh, out in the future. As you ride through this thing, you're going to see what? A lot of pullbacks. You're going to see a lot of volatility as it goes up and down. How do you handle that volatility? How do you ride through it? Is it the conviction of the trade? Because a lot of people, if, if they go and they buy it, they're going to see some volatility up up 100%, down 50, 60, 70%. You know, they're going to get shaken out at the first whiff of, of, a, of a pullback that size. How, how do you ride through it? How do you handle this mentally uh, to ride through this thing? Is it just building the case? And how do you build that case, um, at least the way that you do it? So it depends how, how you want to do things. Like you will see like recently, you know, you saw the RSIs on some of uranium stocks. So they're, I mean, it's definitely overbought. And so you've seen guys on Twitter. I, 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 I lurk around and, and listen to guys. Oh, I'm selling. I'm going to get back in. But will you? See, I can't do that. I'm not that guy. Because then when do you get back in? So um, I know that in the last bull market and the previous one, I can show you junior chart after junior chart. And I went through this exercise in a video. Uh, I think during the last uranium bull market, take a company like Mega Uranium. I'm not saying anything positive about it now or negative. I'm agnostic about it. But it had, I think I showed it had like three or four. I mean, I think it went up 2,000% during the last bull market or maybe a little bit more. But it had, on the way there, it had three or four 50% plus drops, okay? But nothing changed fundamentally along the way, except for that it's a junior mining stock and they're volatile. And in the course of a year, junior mining stocks can go up and down 50% in, in a range easily, you know? And so I think understanding, understanding that and then understanding, like I said, that you understand why you're even, why did you, if you, if I get into, sit down with somebody like at a conference or just talking and I say, well, you know, I'm, they'll say they're, I'm bullish on uranium. They'll say, well, why are you bullish? Tell me, give me the two minute elevator pitch. Well, cause somebody on, you know, because Harris Kupperman said on a podcast that he's all in on uranium. I mean, good luck with that, bro. I mean, if you don't know why you're doing it, you're just, you know, you're kind of, you're speculating and gambling a little bit. So that's really what you got to do. It's like, you got to understand that, you know, I, I, I endured people telling me for when I could see the more and more reactors being built, I said, nuclear power is a growth industry. No, it's not. Well, everybody knows this now because there's 80 companies trying to build SMRs. There's, we're not, we're not going to solve uh, climate change, all stuff with windmills and solar panels. We're going to solve it with SMRs and things like that. That's going to happen. And so we already have, I mean, you know, Justin Hewn and Mike Alkin know more about this than I do, but you know, I'm a generalist, but that's how I get to, to my levels of conviction, you know, it's just like, this is, you know, and again, I know like uranium, for an example, where's it coming from? I mean, I, I, you know, you go, you follow a guy like John Quakes, who's like the CNN of reporting out every little thing that comes out, which is great. I don't see any reports of new mines starting up. Yeah. Honeymoon is what else, what else you got for me? But you, you know, you go to the WNA and click on new nuclear. Well, they just poured the concrete base for this reactor in Bangladesh. They just put the, uh, you know, containment cover on this other one in China. I mean, people are not paying attention. So I think, uh, you know, use a sailing analogy. Are you sailing against the wind or, or with the wind in your sail? And I think if you have the wind in your sail, then you just sit back and you say, okay, if it drops 30% or 50%, I'm, I'm in a bull market. This happens in resource stocks and I buy more if I have capital. 
that's how I look at it. So you're identifying what's in a bull market, what's in a bear market. You're taking that bear mark or the bull, bull market mindset, and then you're going to buy the dips as you get it. And that's absolutely. That's yeah. Yeah. Yep. I do this I have the same strategy. 100%. Um, looking at the, the, the picture today. Um, what do you see out there in terms of the sectors that has value today? What 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 are you interested in? What are you looking at uh, in terms of sectors right now? Well, we've already talked about two, um, but the problem is is that uh, I'm not as bullish on them as I was. There's still money to be made in um, offshore service companies and uranium, but I don't. I'm not so sure about uranium. There's a good chance we could have some crazy, some craziness happen there, but I don't want to go down in that rabbit hole. But, you know, you look at a company, you look at the companies like, look, supply and demand and capitalism works. Okay. Day rates are probably, you've, you've got this, you've got the CEO of Total, which is the French, large, you know, international oil company complaining on his investor day that he was talking about Transocean, for example, is deliberately not, on they won't they have rigs cold stacked and they're acting like opec his words not mine of course they have they have the advantage now and so day rates are going to go up but it's and you know you listen to the ceo of seed drill he says we keep a baseball bat here in the office and if anybody comes in talking about building a new new rig we hit them in the head well eventually when day rates get to eight hundred thousand a day for seven generation rigs or a million dollars a day, somebody's going to go and start building rigs. Supply and demand works. Okay. I don't care what anybody says. It happens in the tanker market. It happens in every market because somebody, they can't help themselves. That's, you know, but, you know, our opportunity is the three to five years between when that happens. So I understand that, you know, supply and demand works and, uh, you know, eventually capital will come because you have these excess returns. This is just like 101 finance stuff now we're getting into. Mm -hmm. And so how much of a time frame do I have to harvest and, and make money? So uh, I kind of got off track there and forgot your question, but I think I answered it a little bit, I hope. Um, what I was saying is kind of what, what do you still think has value in the market? Oh, I know that you're talking okay, about- Okay, yeah. So offshore, offshore nuclear, but not as much. The problem is I don't see a lot of value. One place that I'm seeing value that um, I think it's not 10 baggy, but uh, I'm a big fan of emerging markets, selected emerging markets. I track interest rates and liquidity and uh, I'm not a professional. So, but what I've noticed is, is that um, this rate raising cycle around the world has topped. Uh, the majority of central banks now it used to be most banks were raising rates. Now it's pretty much even. And eventually we're going to get into a new liquidity cycle. And so um, I think the U.S. market's overvalued tremendously. I think it's probably, um, I mean, can't know the future, but uh, I think undervaluation exists in different emerging markets. And if you go back and look at previous um, emerging markets and the U.S. market are 180 degrees out of phase, and these cycles usually last for multiple years. And uh, right now, I think we're at the the, the verge of a inversion. Now, I mean, if you look at GMO, which is uh, they put out a seven-year forward uh, expected returns, you know, they're they're showing right now based on the overvaluations here in the U.S. and the undervaluation in emerging emerging markets, especially emerging market small cap, you're looking at negative annualized returns for the next seven years here in the U.S. We're just, it's, we have the biggest, most overvaluation that we've had by several metrics. And it's, it's totally different in emerging markets. So that's what I try to do. I sell overvaluation and try to buy undervaluation. So I'm excited about that. I am not, a, I would, I, I do not, I'm not interested in any U.S. stocks right now with the exception of these niches that we've talked about. Um, and I'm holding out. I think we're going to have, you know, I, 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 you get in dangerous ground, you start trying to forecast recessions and stuff, but I think we're going to have a hard landing. I think we're going to, we're in the middle of the beginning of a credit cycle. And I, re, and I remember what happened during the last credit cycle when you could buy high yield debt. I don't know. There were companies, Buffett did it. Uh, you could buy companies that had 30, 25, 30, 40% yields to maturity at the bottom. And so um, I'm waiting for those type of opportunities to present themselves. 
uh, here in the U.S. I think it's going to be a tremendous opportunity in real estate. Real estate markets are rolling over. Uh, the bottom line is, is that we have a over-indebted economy that is reliant on we had a lot of things happen that shouldn't have happened over the last decade due to zero interest rates. And now uh, we have an unprecedented quick rise in rates. Uh, and I was wrong about Mr. Powell. He is going to hold things till he gets 2% or something breaks and he's given air cover or forced into reliquifying the system. And then I think there'll be a lot of tremendous bargains there. And I think that will be an opportunity right now. I think the best thing to do with new cash and people don't like this and they get mad about it even in my newsletter new money i'm just what what if if the historical annualized returns on the s p are eight and a half or nine percent with dividends and i can get 5.25 in a treasury bill i'll just sit there right now until i get layups i want to i don't want to force things i don't want to force a shot wait for the layups to come because they will come the bargains will come and uh but we have to go through some pain first i think gold will be you know, I don't like talking about gold miners, but um, I think they have an opportunity to do well uh, during the next cycle of when they liquefy. And, uh, you know, I think things like that, but I don't think anything's right now on my radar. Um, just kind of holding what I got. I'm in, been do, entering a few select things in some emerging markets and then kind of holding what I've got as far as uranium and but I think, you know, you got to get on your radar screen. What does well during when the Fed, uh, it, and it's going to be another shock and awe situation. We're going to have a hard landing, in my opinion. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, when, when if you look at the history of rate cuts and reliquifications of the system, um, rates, they kind of spread them out going up, but they kind of elevator drop when they drop them. I mean, Depending on when this recession starts uh, in the next three, six months, eight months, whatever, sometime in 2024, if you have a big credit event, uh, you know, they'll do what they got to do. And uh, but I think that that I don't see anything that's a real bargain right now. I did see that the BDI broke out to the upside. I know some people have been talking about dry bulk and I'm kind of looking at trade around the world, but I just don't know enough about that market. Um, to look at the supply demand. I mean, I know tankers. I know we're tankers. I probably need to do some work on that, but something's happening there. It's an obvious breakout if you want to use technical analysis, but uh, uh, but stuff like that. I don't have like super high conviction on some of these things right now. So what's, what scares you is, is market slowdown. We've got an inverted yield curve. I'm probably, you might look at that. Uh, generally, during the business cycle, the curve inverts and then it uninverts, and that's where your problem occurs. And yep. I'm sure you're well aware of that. So you think there might be a potential recession here within the next year or so? That's yeah, that's I mean, kind of what you, if you were to take a guess. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't want to sit there and say I'm a macro analyst. I don't want to because I was wrong last year. I thought we were going to have a recession already. We've kind of had a bifurcated economy. I mean, manufacturing kind of isn't a recession. I mean, the PMIs uh, are are under fifty. Housing is not doing that well. Um, people are making excuses for it. The simple fact of the matter is, incomes have not been rising as fast as housing. We have a cohort of millennials. We're going to have a tremendous. You're going to be able to make a ton of money in housing. Not right now. The prices have to come down. The incomes are not sufficient to support these prices. And so something has to break. And uh, it's like an alligator jaw. So I think there'll be tremendous opportunity there. The millennial cohort is is been putting off putting families. It's bigger than the baby boomers were. If you want to get into demographics, I'm a big fan of looking at demographics. But uh, so there's going to be some opportunity there. It's just not the setup isn't there yet, in my opinion, for some of these things. And I think, you know, with um, overvaluation, I like to use the Buffett indicator, you know, market cap to GDP. I mean, we're nowhere near even fair value. I mean, I guess it could go up. I mean, things, could, anything can happen. I'm not a, I'm not an expert, but, um, you know, uh, that, that's kind of my view. And so far I've been wrong. I mean, I got it wrong on, you know, I said on a podcast once I thought that oil could go to 50 before 150. I think it still could do that. Um, you know, we'll see, but, you know, um, the conviction, you, you, when you're talking about the future, you know, what did Yogi Berra say? Uh, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is, so I like to use poker analogies. Part of what we're trying to do is establish what's probable. 
You know what I mean? Yep. What's the probability yep. of an event? And then you have to take data in and assess it. And then if data changes, you have to do, you have to be willing to change your view on some things. And that's hard to do too. Yeah. So you said a hard landing. Is there any reasoning behind you think it's a hard landing versus maybe something that's not as hard? Like, you know, I think of a hard landing like 08, 09. <clears throat> I think more of a softer landing is 2000, 2001. What's uh, like, how how bad do you think it's going to get before the next reliquification phase? I think we're going to have a serious credit event, especially in high yield debt, commercial real estate. No one's talking mm -hmm. about it. Um, regional banks hold all this stuff. We had the, they short circuited the crisis. And this is what they do, right? I mean, you, last, was it last March? We were in the middle. It was happening then. Things were starting to break. And they came in with the different facilities and kind of papered it over. Okay, everything's fine. Go back to the party. Everything's fine. But the fact of the matter is, is the lag effect, you know, takes place. You know, rates might be at five and a quarter uh, on the Fed funds, but, you know, if you go back a year ago, they raised them so fast, you're only like slightly above two and a half percent last this time last year. The lag effect has not made its way through. And there is so much malinvestment in this economy and so much stupid stuff that I'm going to be honest with you. I did a lot of um, angel investing stuff. All, all these companies went bankrupt. There is no more bullshit money out there for every, uh, you know, vanity vodka brand. That's all over with. I mean, I had some legitimate companies. They just couldn't get capital anymore. It started there. And then it's working its way through these different asset classes. And so um, I think that I think people have underestimated how much some of the um, imbalances have built up. And so when I say a hard landing, I mean, I don't know exactly, <clears throat> you know, what's commercial real estate going to do? That's not only um, a credit situation that's a demographic and just the way we've changed doing things people don't want to go back to these offices people don't want to commute to downtown san francisco anymore people don't i mean that's just one city so um and they have leverage over their employers so you know that's just one example i don't want to get too far down the weeds in ec economics because i'm not a macro guy what i what i what i was impressed with is michael michael Kantrowitz at um he came up with this hope framework. I'm a big fan of it. I don't have access to his research. So I tried to build something. I studied it and then I went back and I kind of built my own little index. And I, I have to give the guy credit. I think he's uh, correct on uh, his framework. And, you know, we have to give credit where credit's due. Employment is holding in. That's the last leg of the stool. And as long as people are employed, look, I'm just going to say something. I you know I'm, I, I have money. I can do whatever I want. If you give me $100 extra, I'm just going to, you know, I'm, it's not going to affect my life one way or another. I do what I want to do already. If you give a, you know, an electrician or, or some guy a couple hundred bucks, he's going to take his family out and, you know, go to a ball game or take his wife out or something like that. The propensity to spend is higher. So if employment starts climbing, which I suggest it, unemployment starts climbing and things like this, that's the, that's, it's holding in. Plus you've had a federal government that's spending money at a rate that's similar to like if we were on a wartime footing. The, the the you know so there's a reason why we haven't slipped into recession already. There it's being kind of forestalled. But you know you see what's happening in Washington now. There's not going to be another you know trillion dollars. It's it's just not there anymore. So I think some things are converging. And again, this lag effect is just going to keep tightening the screws as those interest rate previous rate increases work their way through and just start battering down some of this malinvestment that happened. And I think that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of zombie companies that need to go away, a lot of things. So uh, I don't know what the exact situation is going to trigger it, but that's what I think is going to happen. And I didn't believe Mr. Powell at first, and I think he is going to be intent on holding things so he gets his 2% or until something breaks where he can say everybody's begging him, you, even Congress, everybody else. So he'll have the air. So maybe in, the inflation rate's 3.2%. And he says, well, you know, the world's going to end, so I have to start another rate cutting cycle. And then things are going to, real assets are going to just go crazy in that environment. Yeah, totally. In my totally. view. Yeah. So here's another question. I know you you probably own some, you said some uranium, maybe some offshore drilling companies or energy service companies. Are you going to hold through this recession pullback? Are you going to try to time it? Like, what's your thoughts around that? Are you, are you just going to diamond hand it through, or, I mean, what, that's what a lot of people say, <laughs> or are you going to say, you know what, I'm going to ease up here, 
you know, take some off the table, maybe leave 50%, whatever it is, whatever your approach is. What, what do you think there? So when it comes to uranium, I'll just diamond hand because I bought the stuff so cheap. I mean, it would have to go down 90%. It's not, that's not going to happen. And you, you know, what's going to happen is what there's, you know, probably a couple scenarios, right? You could be in a situation where over a six or eight week period, the market drops. Once the market decides that, you know, this is happening, then usually these things resolve fairly quickly. You could be down 30, 30% in the S and P in a couple months. Okay. Everything's going to go down in that environment. I mean, uranium, uranium stocks are stocks, oil service stocks are stocks If the stock market goes down. 95% of stocks go, go down. And so I'll probably, cause I bought things so cheap, I'll probably diamond hand cause I'm just not a trader. Okay. But there'll be some people that trade these things, um, successfully. I'm just not that guy. So, um, I'll probably, unless the businesses actually change, I mean, in offshore drilling, if the stock market drops 30%, that's not going to change Exxon or Shell's 10-year development plan in offshore Guyana, right? It's just not. Okay. So um, so this, I think, again, I've been raising cash. Let's not forget that. And cash keeps coming in, dividends, W-2, side businesses, whatever. And so I think those are opportunities to take another bite of the apple. And and I think I would probably be reloading and buying more because I think that uh, in, in those cases. Now, that's me. That's, that's, that's What I tell people is this. Here's what happens. You have to know yourself, right? You have to have introspection. You know, people email me all the time or message me, hey, you, the last year and a half before this recent run in uranium, we had this peak like 18 months ago, and it's been a slow slide. You know, people are like, well, I bought at the top because, you know, I bought URNM when it was a hunt, when it was, well, it'd be 50 split adjusted and it's down, which, well, the, you should buy more because we're in a bull market. That's what I would do. But if you're chewing your fingernails, staring at the ceiling at night and you can't sleep then sell, you know, and uh, your peace of mind is, but everybody's different. So that's, I'll probably just blow through because nothing business wise will change. I hope oil goes negative again. I hope we have another GFC. That would, I mean, I don't hope because a lot of people be hurt, but for me personally, that would, you know, that'll be, maybe I will get on the, the cover of Forbes then finally. So uh, these are opportunities to me, but like it, yep. it's taken me decades to get there. So my views and the way I do things, my EQ and things like that are different than somebody that's 22 or 26 listening to this. You know what I mean? So if you if you if you are in uranium, let's say for this example, and you stumble this into it's like walking down the street and you find a hundred dollar bill. Well, you, how did you get how did you get that? Well, you just happened by luck to get there. So if you understand these markets and you have conviction and you understand why you're in them, then that's a different view than if you just got into it by you happen to listen to some podcasts, thought it was a good idea, and you're up 150% in a year, maybe you should think about taking some down and reassessing everything. It's just a different, everybody's going to have to be a different view. But my thing is I'm going right through it and I'll buy on dips because I know what, the, I know what's going to happen. There I'm is saying. no, there is no way out. They're going to print is you're going to be shocked at the end of this decade, how big the feds balance sheet is there. There is no way out of this. Now it's not fixable. They're going to, they're going to keep running the same playbook. And when they do that, hard, you know, real assets are going to go, they're going to moon. I hate to, I hate to hate steel cuppies, Thunder. He's right. Project Zimbabwe, man. That's what it's going to be. And can you get through the six months of pain? And then, you know, some people get cute and try to trade it. Some of them will do well. Some of them won't. I'm not that guy. So let's say you're a, a person who's new to the, to the market. All right. You don't know much about investing. Uh, you said that if you knew what you knew now when you were in in your early 20s, you'd just be killing it. How, what, what would you tell someone who, you know, what would you tell yourself, 19, 20 year old, your, you know, yourself, how would you tell yourself to get there the fastest possible way? Uh, what would you need to do? What would you need to learn? What would you need to read to get yourself, your 20 year old self, is quickly educated in learning how to invest as possible. How, how would you do that? Well, again, I will, I hate to say this, people are, you know, they might just think it's copping out, but we didn't have the internet back then for me. You have it now. 
there's a guy, I don't know who the guy is. He's kind of created a cottage industry around this compounding quality guy on Twitter. Everybody should go there. Follow this guy. He's on Substack now. He has Joel Greenblatt's Columbia course. Joel Greenblatt's a very famous, you know, man, head money manager, very successful. I think he compounded at like 30% a year. His whole Columbia course is there. Every writing that Warren, all these famous guys, all these, there's thousands of pages he's collated. You can download it for free and start reading. I hate to tell this, but somebody asked this of Munger when he was at a Stanford MBA uh, uh, thing and one of the prospective MBAs asked him, what would be your best piece of advice? He said, read 500 pages a day. You have to have knowledge. You have to have this lattice work of knowledge. What would I do if I was 19 or 20? I would accumulate cash and I would start, you know, I would watch every Charlie Munger YouTube video I could get my hands on. And I would, you know, people can make fun of these guys, but they're billionaires and you're not, you know, we're not, you know? And so you need to understand if you want to become wealthy, how did, you know, I have somebody I was mentoring and they were like, yeah, but my folks told me to do this or that. I said, are they wealthy? No. Well, then why are you listening to them? They're your folks and you should love and care about them, but they're not where you want to be. You got to listen to the people that have demonstrated that they've done things. You know, if you want to be in the resource market, you know, you should be listening to people that are successful, you know, in the resource market, you know, Rick rules fa famous, you know, uh, um, Robert Friedland, Ross Beatty, these kind of people, you should understand how they've made their money and how things really work. You should visit a, uh, uh, one of these conferences in Vancouver and see how things really are. Okay. Um, and understand what you're dealing with. Um, then you should get a grub stake together. And Charlie says it perfectly. He, he uses the term hundred grand. You got to get a hundred grand. It's probably about 200 grand. Now you got to have money. If you're going to go in there with a Robin hood account with a thousand bucks. It's going to be hard, man. But you got it. You just got to keep building your grub steak, grind, and then wait for these. Wait for it where it's an obvious layup. And but you got to have some education because how do you recognize it? You got to go back to the masters, and they'll teach you. They'll, they'll, they talk. You know. Another thing I would do, I wouldn't do. I wouldn't play poker, but I would understand. Like read Doyle Brunson's books. Read famous poker players' books because what's it give you? This is a game of probabilities and thinking through what are the probabilities and setups. You know, things, because we're dealing with humans and markets, they, re, they repeat constantly. And so you need to understand psychology and human nature because you can use that to your advantage. We just talked about the resource market. We talk about, okay, oil and these other things, uranium. Well, well what's the ci cyclicality? Understand cyclicality. Go to the Altius Minerals website. Look at the current presentation. They show on one of the slides about how they're successful in the resource business. It's real easy. It's a sine wave. Buy here, sell here. But it, I mean, <laughs> it's not that easy, though. But you see what I'm saying? And then you got to you know, read some books about psychology. Stand in front of a mirror and go, what do I, how much risk am I really willing to take? Am I built for this? Because not everybody's built for it. You know, I wanted to be a professional baseball player. I couldn't hit major league pitching. Couldn't even hit, you know, high level high school pitching. I wasn't going to be a baseball player. Some people just aren't built for it because they don't like risk. They let it get to them, whatever. So you got to kind of, if I was 19 or 20, I'd be like, well, if I want to be an investor, then, you know, Meb Faber has some good papers on his thing. He advises people, I wouldn't just say buy the S&P, but you can buy, you can set up a, just with ETFs, like a world index. You're going to average, you know, a worldwide index. You're going to average seven or eight percent a year, up and down. And over forty years, you're going to you're going to do well. You know what I mean? And then you don't have to even do anything. You can go enjoy your life and not worry about things. But uh, you know, it just depends what you want to do and what how much work you want to put in and what your temperament is. I mean, that's what I would tell a, uh, somebody young getting into this. The worst thing you do is just run into the burning building because I watched the YouTube video. Man, uranium's going up. These guys don't. Let me get in. You know, you're buying at the top. I guarantee it. Or, or one of the one of the intermediate tops. It happens. And then the guy emails me. Hey, this is down thirty percent. Yeah, bro, because you FOMO'd into this thing right at an intermediate top. You know. So anyway, that's what I would say. Yeah, and you said something about risk, and I I do want to ask a question on that. Um, in terms of risk, what? Uh, how do you perceive risk? Is it like companies that are more speculative? Is it cash flow that you perceive as less risk? What? How do you perceive risk uh, when you go and you buy a company or 
perceived risk in maybe a sector? Well, that's that's a good question. So, I mean, because we've been talking a lot about like uh, these cyclical type situations, there's a lot of risk there because first of all, a lot of people that get into this, they don't understand the cyclicality. It's not like you're buying like a company that's just compounding earnings like Coca-Cola back in the day or Monster or something like that. I mean, people should get that book, uh, 100 Baggers by Chris Mayer. He kind of profiles that or how to, how to make 100 to 1 in the stock market. It was written in, in the 50s by a guy named Thomas Phelps. And he, they profile these companies that over 20 or 30 years are running a business and they just slowly over time recycle capital back into the business at high returns and you just buy and hold. Well, that's kind of different than what we're talking about a little bit. We're talking more... Yeah, it's investing, but a lot of speculating here too. So um, risk, uh, you know, when you're dealing with cyclical things or these things that are like, um, uh, like in uranium or something like that, we were talking about buying it five or six years ago. You know, you don't go all in. You, you take a position and then as you build your conviction, as the information comes in, you can, your risk will either go up or down, right? As more information comes out, the risk is declining, right? Risk reward. Somebody did a good, uh, oh, I forget uh, how they did it. I, I can't illustrate it, but I mean, it's kind of a subjective question because it kind of ties into like, what's your analysis actually, you know? So um, I think one thing that I've heard is a good idea is, you know, you just don't go all in, you know, you can segregate your, as be part of your investment plan that you should write down like, okay, I'm trying to build wealth to buy a house or for retirement or for somebody's, my kid's education. Well, that's a different probably set of metrics. If you're doing what we're trying to do is trying to turn a dollar into 10, well, then you spread your bets a little bit more. And then if you get more conviction in something as things develop, like we're talking about uranium, I mean, now it's just a matter of how high it's going to go and how long it's going to take. I mean, I think everybody gets what's happening. There's so many tailwinds to this unless you have another Fukushima or something. So you just buy the dips. So your risk, but you had the initial positions and you were building over time as you got more conviction. So I would say that's one way to do it. But I think a lot of it ties in. I don't think it's, I'm not copping out, but it's this kind of a complex question based on the individual, what they're trying to do, what they're willing to do, how much cash they have. You know, you'll say some people will say, well, this money manager only has three or four positions. Yeah. But you know, how much work and conviction do they have on it? That's, them you know their temperament's different than mine or your temperament too so it, it I, I i hope i answered the question but the, i'm not trying to cop out on it but it's it's, it's kind of a sub, more subjective question i can i can give you my opinions on it maybe we can go back and forth real quick but you know when i look at a risky company uh, i think of that as a small cap company with a single mine doesn't have any cash flow and I look at it like, man, this is pretty risky. Like, this is a this is a full yeah. on speculation. You're hoping that money flows into this thing. And then I look at another company where it's an oil gas company. We've got this blowing out oil price. They've got assets in place that were generating four billion in cash flow last you know bull market. And I'm looking at this thing, and it's a 200 million market cap. And I'm going, oh my god, this is ridiculous. Um, that's what I mean by the the potential risk is. You know, I look at it as what is when I look out in the future, can I see them making cash? And if there's a lot of obstacles in front of my way for them to make cash, I just think, OK, this is pretty risky. If it's just a matter of the commodity going up, well, I get all the price leverage and the risk is really not there uh, like it would be in some small mining company with only one mine and some off scattered place. Um, so, I mean, do you perceive risk the same way roughly or? Is what I was yeah, I see what you're there. saying. I, I try to differentiate by saying from investing versus speculating, and you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, when you're buying, oh, let's just use some names, okay? Let's throw it out there, okay? Yeah. You can go and buy, um, you know, at the bottom when oil was trading at $47, negative 47. I publicly told people, I don't like the management. I hate the management of this company, Athabasca Oil. It's an oil sands producer, Okay. I hate the management. I think they get paid way too much. For, anyway, we won't get into that. But it was selling for like 15 cents a share. It, and I said it very plainly. If oil doesn't go back above 50 or $60 a barrel, you could have looked at it. This company is going to go bankrupt. If it 
gets back to 50 or 60, which I think in that range was, it, it was able to pay its debt. And if anything goes above that, this thing's, this thing's a 10 bagger. Okay. I think it's trading at over $4 a share right now. Uh, then you look at boss honeymoon. That. Okay. Well, you look at honeymoon mine it with boss. Okay. Yeah. Everybody's like, Oh, oh boss honeymoon. Wonderful. You're right. Single mine producer haven't validated the production yet. I believe it's the ISR mine that somebody else had at one time that had problems producing it. They're back in there trying to produce it. That's speculative. There's more risk there. I mean, there's no risk really to Athabasca except for the fact of where do you think the oil price is going to go and does it cash flow? There were other names. I don't want to name them because they're in my portfolio that are even better names than that. You could have bought CNQ. They were giving away CNQ, which is the best, probably the best managed Canadian oil sands company in the history of the world. I mean, so uh, for, for giveaway money. So you knew that it was going to come back, wasn't going to go bankrupt. So I, I see your point and I kind of agree with you. I like cash because I like, you know, I'm a big Walter Schloss fan. Excess cash is does three things, right? You either pay down debt, which is accretive to equity holders. Once you do that, then we're talking about dividends and share buybacks, which is what I want to see. So um, it, uh, if you're messing around with junior mining, that's speculation. That's all that is. Okay, it's trading sardines. Quite frankly, um, I don't know who's going to produce during this, uh, become a producer. But you got to remember, look at a guy like... Um, John Borshoff that brought Paladin in. He brought it in right at the top and it ended up going, Langer Heinrich went bankrupt. So it's, he's out, he's at another company now. And so exactly, that's uh, that, that's kind of, you know, and mining, look, when you're talking about mining and you're talking about oil and gas and stuff like this, these are really horrible businesses. They're, they're, they're hard, uh, they take a lot of money, things don't go well sometimes. Um, I've been on projects, not mining, but other large industrial projects. Everybody on the project's trying to wreck the project. I don't mean that literally, but it just seems like all this weird stuff happens. Supply delays, something breaks. This didn't get engineered properly. Labor problem. I mean, it's 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 always going to be something. And so, um, you know, that's – I know we're talking a lot about uh, – um, resource stocks and that's just it's just they're not very good businesses except for small periods of time when they make excess profits and that's where you know and then capital comes in i mean what's going to happen i mean think about it at the top of this uranium market you're probably going to have like you did the last cycle 500 listed uranium companies well if they each have a million or 200 mil or 2 million a year in gna that's a billion dollars a year in gna what do you think there's going to be a lot of shares being issued by a lot of companies to keep the lights on and you're going to know it's a top. So yeah, I see your point and I, I agree with it. I mean, I'm big on cash flow, but you know um, that's why I tell people, you know, if you want to, you know, you could have bought, like I said, you could have bought Cameco at the, at the COVID lows at six and a half dollars a share. It's like over 40 now. So there's nothing wrong with, if you're going to go into some of these markets, you know, buy the real business, you know, if you can buy it cheap. And people say, well, I'm not going to buy Cameco at $40 a share. I mean, I'm, yeah, because you, 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 you have the wrong view. If you, if you weren't in earlier, you have the wrong view now because you have the wrong expectation. You're not, you know, buying it as a business. You're trying to get rich quick because I don't know who hasn't heard about uranium yet, but I guess there are some folks that are just yeah. still. Anyway, I, I get your point, and I, I, I agree with you. Uh, I think you said it, said it best. But I think people need to differentiate between investing and speculating. And I think they confuse them sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So just, I mean, just to let you know, a lot of people, I talk with a lot of people and they they ask a lot of questions to me. And and a lot of the times they bring up these companies that are just like junior gold companies and, and junior silver companies that are just really small micro caps. They don't have anything. Uh, they're drilling or whatever, uh, which is speculative. And, you know, I look at my portfolio and it's really not made up of hardly any of those companies. Um, you know, what would you tell the, the 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 investor out there, you know, maybe how you, what your viewpoint is and how you maybe put companies into your portfolio? Do you go after those junior speculative companies? Do you avoid them like they're the plague? Like what what's your opinions on those? That's why people need to go to at once in their life to one of these junior mining conferences. You'll see a lot of good speakers. You'll be able to sit right there and you Rick Rule will sit on a stool. You can talk to him. You can talk to all these guys. They'll all be there. <clears throat> then you'll go out in the hall 
and there'll be 100 or 200 mining companies there, junior resource companies. And if you talk to the people at each one of the booths, it's nothing but rainbows and Skittles. Can't wait, okay? Uh, how wonderful it's going to be. And so it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. If you really want to be successful, you need to wait for the obvious layups. And then why, why do I need to go and buy some crappy um, company, you know, that who knows, Moose, Jaw, Saskatchewan, last month it was a gold company, now it's a uranium company. The management has no experience in either one of the metals. They have no record of success when, you know, if you buy things at the bottom of the cycle, you can buy the champion of the industry for giveaway money. That's your best bet. And so if you've missed things, like I said, there's still juice in this lemon in, in some of these things. But again, it goes back to what we talked about at the start. You've got to be in there before everybody else. And uh, you got to be in a sector when it's at the complete bottom, when absolutely no one, when you're, gonna, when you're actually going to take abuse for even suggesting buying it. And then, you know, then you have to do the work and, and that's hard to do. And, uh, but I, there's so many people doing that now, it shouldn't be that hard to figure out, you know, where to go. And then, you know, don't try to get too cute with it because, you know, you could have bought like rig, like Transocean under a dollar a share, you know, 18 months ago and the bonds were selling at 50 cents on the dollar. Everybody said it was going to go bankrupt. Now that was more speculative. There was probably better companies in that industry to buy, or you could just have bought the, bought, you know, um, Schlumberger. That was a public uh, thing that I said, I said, oil steel service, come back, just buy Schlumberger. And, you know, I ended up selling it, but it was up like 70 or 80%. I mean, that's like a $40 billion company. If you buy things cheap enough at the bottom, then you don't have to worry about messing around with junk. And I think that you don't want to do that because what's going to, here's how junior mining works. Um, most of the companies are run by charlatans. Um, they're flim flam people. That's not everybody. There's legitimate people out there. It takes a lot of work and relationships to understand who these people are. And the way you make money in that industry is being, having enough cash to be, a um, being at the private placement table so that when you get the shares, you get a warrant at the bottom of the cycle and then you sell the shares and keep the warrant. And then if you put a package together like that, then it pays off. That's how that's really done. And you have to know people because Marin Katusa is not going to let you into a private placement if he doesn't know you. Okay. That's how these things work. Same thing with Rick at Rule and all these guys. That's how they made their money. They're inside, they're at the table making the deals. That's how money's made in junior resources with these shitty little trading sardines some of the end up no i mean seriously that's true. because i agree you know I that's how agree. it's done so the best thing to do is find out a blown out industries or whatever or something that's cheap that has a, you can make a case has a probability of turning that eventually the market will realize that and then ascribe a higher value which we've done in oil and i mean when oil seriously when oil was negative 47 that's when you needed to be all in. Can you make money now? Yeah, you can buy Shell. Shell got a new CEO. They, they're going to get rid of renewables and it's selling at an enterprise value of three and Exxon and Chevron are at six. So yeah, it's probably going to play catch up, but that's not going to be a 10 bagger from here. You know what I mean? So there are still opportunities. It's like, again, risk, how much risk do you want to take? So, um, you know, things like that. So but if you do think negative 47, did you believe or anybody you talked to believe that people were actually saying oil is going to go away? This is our opportunity to get rid of oil. And I'm thinking to myself, we've got the entire world locked down. We had 100 million barrels a day or right before 100 million barrels a day before uh, COVID. And now it's 86 million. This is all they wrote, all the demand they were able to get rid of. Oil is going a lot higher, man. Buy, oh, yeah. you know, and then, you know, there were. Oh, yeah. You could have bought Meg Energy. You could have bought a whole bunch of companies for just like pennies on the dollar. That's what you got to do. Yeah, you got to. So yeah, I, I totally agree. I think you should buy premium companies when the time is right, uh, and that's your lowest risk way to play the markets is to buy premium companies at the right time and and ride it through the the bull cycle or or the cycle that's yeah. uh, favorable for them. The wind at the sails. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share? With 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 the viewers, anything else that you'd like to comment on, uh, or or any other things that uh, you'd like to share? 
No, I would just say, you know, don't, don't forget that, that, you know, this is not easy and that you have to do work and you have to, the way you're going to have your advantage is, um, you have to do like Munger says, you have to build your knowledge base and that takes a lot of work. I'm not saying the average person listening to this is not going to read 500 pages a day, but you have to, you should be in there reading every day with these successful guys. So you got to go to, you know, success leaves clues. And, uh, you know, I think if I was younger, I would have realized that I wish somebody would have taught me that and said, okay, you know, you're, what you're doing right now is just hit and miss. And you're going to, you're, you're going to have inconsistent returns. Yeah. It was good years, but you want to have consistent returns over time. And, and I think you have to educate yourself and it, I mean, things get complicated, but it's not really that hard. Again, it's, I think being patient, waiting for, you know, super easy things to happen and then, you know, jumping on it and then just having the patience to sit there and let it play out. I think that's all I would say. I mean, that's that, I don't want to say it's that easy, but it kind of is that easy. It's just the hard part is the patience and the EQ and being able to go through some of the drawdowns. I mean, it wasn't fun sitting here for the last year or so while nothing was happening in uranium, but fundamentally it kept improving every every week, every month. The fundamentals just kept getting better. So it's just a matter of time before the price was going to react. So, and here we are now. That's that's about all I would say. Yeah, logic easy, emotionally tough. There you go. <laughs> um, so if someone wanted to reach out to you or follow your work, how do they do it? Just go on YouTube. I just do a weekly video. I call it my market, weekly market report. Um, so I just been making those videos since the first Bitcoin rally that happened. Some people called me. I remember it was like two, when was the first thing when it went to like 14,000? It's 2018, I think. I can't remember. 17, whatever it was. And a bunch of people that I didn't know anything about Bitcoin called me and said, what do I think about Bitcoin? I said, I'm going to get on, this isn't, you know, this is the top guys. You know, this is, this is the shoe shine boys calling me. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I have a YouTube channel. You can contact me through that. I do have a newsletter, but all that stuff's in the show notes of these, uh, YouTube videos. And I'm on Twitter. Just put my name in Twitter. I don't hide behind any aliases. So I'm out there. I make some good calls and sometimes I make some bad calls. That's when you put, when you're out in the public, that's going to happen. Um, I wouldn't listen to anything I say. Uh, what I would do is, even in my newsletter, I don't make recommendations. What I say is, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it. Uh, we have a Discord. We have a lot of smart guys on there, people exchanging information, challenging ideas like, hey, you missed this or Did you, what about this? And it's it's been pretty helpful for me too. So uh, um, that's kind of what the whole purpose of the newsletter is. It's uh, I don't give recommendations. I, I, I don't get too slimy. I have a free weekly um, email I send out kind of what, what I'm looking at. It's high level. And so there's a lot of things available there and people can check it out. And if they want to email me, the contact informations are out there. I'm, I'm available. Hi. Right. Awesome. Well, that's all I've got, John. I really appreciate you coming on the channel and uh, yeah, thanks for it. Perfect. See you, everyone. Thank you.